There's a bit of a challenge here, isn't there? You know, you, you let me go off and, and become an academic for, for two years, and you're going to get a very boring theoretical presentation, I'm afraid. Uh, that's the challenge of, of, of letting me get my doctorate. So uh, I'm going to start out with a bit of science. And uh, that, I'm sure some of you will guess, is, is the world's biggest scientific experiment. It's the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. And it's probably one of the most complex devices ever invented. But its aim is to simplify the world. Its aim is to simplify our understanding, to try and unify the theory of quantum mechanics and general relativity and all this stuff together into the simplest rules we can find to understand the universe. And that is fundamentally the aim of science. Science is our aim to simplify. And when I was a kid, I used to love maths and physics. I used to spend my summer holidays reading books on quantum mechanics and mathematics and stuff. And what I didn't love was biology. Uh, I hated biology. I gave up on biology as soon as I could. And, and the reasons why are things like this. So this is, if you're a mathematician, this is like one of those formula that just blows your mind. This is like the seven most key symbols in mathematics related in a, in a, in a bit of truth that somehow this works out and no one can quite understand it because this is to do with circles and logarithms and uh, imaginary numbers and somehow you add that together with one and you get zero. It's, it's incredible. It blows the minds of mathematicians. This is, of course, probably the most famous physics equation ever. And I think the reason why is it's so simple, isn't it? It's amazing that the, the heart of nuclear fission and fusion can be captured in this sort of catchphrase, this simple catchphrase. And this is a biological equation. <laughs> and I do not understand this at all. This is biology. This is basically explaining gen genetics in equations. And it is completely like, what the hell is going on? So, so why am I talking to you about biology if it's so annoying and complex? Well, fundamentally, biology is actually the study of complex systems. And, and what I'm here to talk to you today about is the fact that enterprise architecture is a complex system. And we need to understand and deal with complexity if we're going to tame it and move forward and, and, and get value out of this. And so that's really my, my thesis. And I'm going to start with probably the, the most key part of biological systems, which is this concept called adaptation. So biological adaptation is when you, an organism or a species becomes better suited to its environment. And this is really what we want to do with enterprise. This is what agile enterprise, composable enterprise, agile integration is all about. Is we're trying to adapt our IT to become better suited to our environment, to our competitors, to our uh, aims in life, so that we can scale better, uh, provide new capabilities better, and so forth. And, and biology is very, very good at this. This is, this is the result of biological adaptation. Uh, and it's amazing how this works. And, it, and it's kind of mind-blowing. Uh, and we have our own versions of this in the IT world. So A-B testing. This is what Facebook does to us every day. They send out half of their new updates to one group and a different update to another. And they measure how many clicks we give. And this is how they know which icons to color red and blue and how to, how to fry our brains with their little uh, bleeps and tweets and, and everything. And this is, this is how people are basically adapting uh, user interfaces to be better responsive to the environment. But something more basic, version control is a kind of biological adaptation. We have a new version of our software. If it fails the tests, it dies. That's, that's it. It is not, it is not, uh, it has no life. It isn't survival of the fittest version. And if it, if it works and it's better, then we move to the new version. 
And this is what blue-green and rainbow deployments and canary testing are all about, is basically finding out which version is fitter and, and will survive. So when we talk about agility, I think really we're using it as a word that actually means adaptation. Agility on its own, our ability to iterate fast is not important. Our ability to iterate is only important in the context of whether we have the right selection mechanism and the right way forward so that we can adapt and build a better system. So this is why fast iterations are important, because we need those fast iterations to drive selection. We need that to drive adaptation and adaptability. And, and this is really what we're aiming for. And I think this is really important to bear in mind when you build your agility, that you are actually, there's a higher goal here. Now, that said, I think the word agility, we all understand implicitly that this is what we're aiming for. So I think agility is a, is a good word for this, but just remember that, that adaptation is the end goal here. And one of the adaptations we've seen happen in the IT industry uh, is this adaptation towards disaggregated services, towards smaller and smaller components. And we've seen consumer demand driving companies like Google, Uber, Amazon, eBay, and, and almost every company to become more responsive and more adaptive. And as they've done that, if you notice, they have built smaller and smaller components to do that. And they've made those components network accessible endpoints. And if you look at this, this seems like an inevitable track and trajectory, because this is actually something that you can trace back over 50 years of, of disaggregation, from mainframes, monolithic applications through client server, departmental apps through SaaS, APIs, and now we have microservices and serverless. So this seems like an, inexor an inexorable change and adaptation that's required. And I really see this as disaggregating in two dimensions. So we've seen, I, my, my introduction to this was I, you know, I spent the last 20 years of my life really helping people disaggregate function first. You know, I was, I was one of the key architects of the web service platform at IBM. Uh, and that concept of SOA, uh, and then we've moved to APIs, and now we have endpoints. And this disaggregation of function into independent units that can be replaced and responded is really what John was talking about earlier. And then we've seen a corresponding disaggregation away from the, away from the bare metal, away from the, the hardware, into more and more disaggregated components in the infrastructure dimension. So through operating systems, through virtualization, through cloud, through containers, and now into systems like Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes, which are giving us this ability to really disaggregate and decouple in the infrastructure dimension. When you disaggregate in these two dimensions, that's really what we call cloud native. Cloud native is really the ability to have these components that are independent functional components that talk over the network and deployed in very lightweight, uh, disaggregated, decoupled from the, from the hardware and infrastructure. And so that's what it is, but why? What, what's going on here? What's the driver for this? Well, the first driver is that we're adapting to functional requirements. So in other words, we're trying to build new business processes, we're trying to put out new applications. We're trying to create new function. And this disaggregated endpoints, APIs, and capabilities are helping us do that much faster. So that's really about agility. The second aspect is adaptation to demand, the ability to scale up and scale down rapidly and easily. And that's the cloud aspect of this, and that ability to uh, take these small components and scale just the right parts, scale them up and down quickly, is giving us that scale adaptation. 
And then there's a really important part of this, which is cost. So smaller components can be packed more tightly into virtual machines. So anyone who's seen an AWS bill or an Azure bill for their organization will know this. This is when you stop using virtual machines and you start using containers because your bill, you know, you start using Amazon. And, and I remember three or four years ago when we started getting five-figure monthly bills from Amazon, and we started thinking, OK, how can we optimize this a bit? And uh, the and I know certainly I know some organizations that are building preemptible systems so that they can shift them into spot priced AWS instances, which cost half as much. They can move their workload around from data center to data center. And of course, pay as you go, the ability to really scale from zero up and not pay for stuff you're not using is a key part of the serverless drive and is really about adapting to cost. So all of these things are, I mean, this is an amazing, an amazing trifecta of, of, of drivers. You know, we're building function faster, we're scaling better, and we're reducing cost. It's no wonder that this disaggregation is unstoppable. So this is a, one of my favorite authors. It's a guy called William Gibson. And he writes sort of science fiction set maybe 10 or 15 years into the future. Uh, he, he wrote the first sort of book imagining what the internet would look like before the internet existed and what it would be like if everyone was connected through cyberspace. Um, and and his, one of his most famous quotes is, the future's already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. And I think this really applies to agility very clearly. Agility is here. It's just not very evenly distributed. So this uh, report, which came out recently, basically said that 60% of organizations have, uh, have implemented agile processes. A further 12% feel that they have a high-level competency. So. Overall, about 75% of organizations are doing Agile, but only 4% of them are seeing that at the enterprise level. Only 4% are seeing adaptation to market conditions. So in other words, everyone's doing the, the Agile, but they're not seeing the outcome. And we at WSO2 are putting our hands up as part of the problem here. Because we think that the biggest challenge here is integration. Because it's not the low-level projects that aren't agile. It's how you then take those projects and put them together and put it out to the, to the enterprise that is the block. There is a bottleneck here. And we think that integration is a big part of that bottleneck. And, and we think that we, you know, unwillingly, we've become part of that problem, and we want to solve that. So what is, what is agility about? Well, agility starts with developer flow. So developer flow is when you edit, build, deploy, test in fast cycles. You go through those cycles quickly, and you, you zone out. You forget what the time is. You just start firing on all cylinders, and you become highly productive. Who, 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 come on, the developers in the audience. Who, who knows this feeling? Right, yes. So there's a few hands up there. If you're not a developer, you should become one. Try this. This is, this is like drugs. This is, this, is, this is drugs. Basically, your brain is creating tiny dopamine hits as you go through this. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it, it's an addictive experience. This is why developers like writing code. And, and you know, learn Python, or better still, come to BallerinaCon on Wednesday and learn Ballerina. And you will, you will learn how to quickly get some of these dopamine hits. So this is amazing. 
And then we get developer team flow. This is when the whole team is firing on all cylinders and working effectively together. And then there's this feeling that you're part of an active team. You're all heading in the same direction. You're working together. This is, this is even better. This is really amazing. This is, this, is, this is what we aim for, what we strive for as developers. But it doesn't always work well. Sometimes it goes wrong. Anyone rode here? It's called catching a crab. When your oar suddenly goes and you fall out the boat. Uh, it feels like something's grabbed hold of your oar and it's because you've been out of time with the rest of your, your team. So what interrupts that team flow? Well, unfortunately, the wrong organization interrupts team flow. Sitting in a long, boring meeting with the wrong people while people discuss endless stuff interrupts team flow. Developers hate meetings because it's taking them away from that, from that, that cycle, that flow. And Tyler talked about how the organization around our center of excellence can inhibit team flow. We call it fast waterfall. I was talking to one of my customers last week, and he said, oh yeah, we call it wagile. <laughs> I thought that's awesome. If you only learn one thing today, I think the word wagile should go home with you. Uh, that's from a guy called Mark Brogdon at Jaguar Land Rover. Um, and this is, I'm sorry, John, this is from one of your competitors. Donnie Burkholz is, is an analyst at, at 451 Group. And he says, you say center of excellence, I hear silo. And unfortunately, that's not what we aimed for when we started building integration software 13 years ago. We wanted to break down silos. That was the aim of integration, was to destroy silos and break them down. And somehow we've ended up in a new silo. That's painful. So complex processes interrupt flow. When I have to go through some complex workflow to get something approved, when I have a heavyweight governance process, all of these things stop me from getting on with coding and being productive and, and taking out what I need to. And unfortunately, the wrong technology stack interrupts flow. If your architecture is highly layered, then that gives good governance. It has all sorts of benefits. But it means that I have to talk to 15 other people to get anything done. When the architecture is highly layered, it doesn't always have the right characteristics for agility. So for example, if your integration tool doesn't support continuous integration, continuous build, doesn't fit well into different staging environments, doesn't have continuous test, then all of these things make it unpleasant for developers to use. And the reality is that developers don't really like ESBs. You know, that's true. And we've spent a lot of the last 13 years trying to make it more agile, better. And we're continuing to do that. But the reality is that the, the heart of why that is, is because it doesn't fit well into the edit, build, deploy, test cycle. And the more we can fit into that developer flow, the more we can enable team flow, the happier people will be, the faster those cycles will be, and the more adaptive your organization can become. And this has created what we call an integration agility gap. So when we started WSO2 12, 13 years ago, our customers were typically on a 6, 9, 12, 18-month deployment cycle for their applications. And we came in and said, you don't touch the application. We can deploy an ESB in a month, two months, three months, and we can help you be more agile. We can leave those things that are slow alone, and we can build faster, more agile integration. And we have increased that speed from, say, three months to, say, 
six to eight weeks now for a deployment. But at the same time, those CI, CD, and development teams have just gone crazy. You know, there are lots of companies out there that are re releasing fortnightly, weekly, twice weekly, daily, hourly. And, and, and we have been left behind. We have been, we have been disrupted by agility. And this is really a, about those tools, the continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous test tools, and things like type safety, better editor tools for, for developers, uh, better team tools, Git and GitHub. All of these things have made developers into the rock stars of IT. And they're the rock stars because of this speed of, of deployment and delivery. And I think what Tyler was saying is our mission at WSO2 is to help you as integration guys and girls, and, and we're in San Francisco, so any other genders that you may align with, uh, become rock stars in the same way, to become as agile as you need to be with integration. So I think a really important aspect is there's a whole third dimension to this. I talked about infrastructure and function, but the third dimension is organization. We have to decouple integration from being centralized to being decentralized. We have to decouple the integration organization. And that's what gives us a composable enterprise. And this shift from a center of excellence to a composable enterprise is about a shift from fixed infrastructure to cloud orchestration, from, from managing monoliths to managing and scaling individual components, from doing complex manual testing processes on your integration to doing automated uh, testing and CI, CD, from doing centralized log monitoring to doing distributed observability, from having a centralized legacy data and a layered data architecture, to having individual cells, having individual data stores for microservices, having caching layers and streaming data, doing synchronization. And from a central engagement team to a central enablement team. So really from having a team that does the integration to having a team that maybe is a distribution of excellence rather than a center of excellence. And what we see, what I see my customers doing and a lot of customers doing is that they've moved the development of their digital domain into a new a layer in their organization. So I have multiple customers who've done this. They've said, well, okay, we're going to wrap the existing legacy systems with APIs, events, and streams. We're going to take those and we're going to now put in place Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes. We're going to build out a digital orchestration layer. And we're going to put microservices and serverless components in there. And uh, that's got some good things about it. But I have a feeling that we're going to run into trouble. So I think the, the big problem here is that we haven't got the right abstractions and the right mental model of this yet. So abstractions are really, really important to simplification. That's really what that CERN Large Hadron, com sorry, Large Hadron Collider is about. That is what all those formula and equations are about. They're trying to abstract away from reality and find the right mental models. And abstractions are really, really important to us. And there's this thing called the fundamental theorem of software engineering is that all problems in computer science can be solved by another layer of indirection. Now, that was actually misquoted. It's originally a quote from David Wheeler, uh, and this other guy quoted it widely and made it quite famous. But he misquoted it because he left out half of the original saying, which was slightly funnier, except for the problem of too many layers of indirection. 
And actually, bizarrely, this is really what we founded WSO2 to do. So Sanjeev and I were at IBM, and we saw IBM building bigger and bigger middleware, middleware layers and adding more and more layers of indirection. And we thought we needed to radically simplify that. And that's really what we aimed to do with the Carbon platform, was to create a simpler layer. What we're now seeing is that there's another layer of radical simplification that can happen. And that's really where, where our long-term vision of Ballerina is, which is that it's a radical simplification of middleware, and that middleware in many ways is vanishing. And we think that the right simple abstraction to have it, on, your, on your IT infrastructure to be agile is this very simple abstraction of APIs, events, and streams. And it's an important because it has, it has both push and pull. So a very important part of this cloud scalable architecture is event-based integration and event-based models and having both push and pull. So what does API events and streams do for you? Well, firstly, APIs give you an abstraction over things that can be queried or activated. Events give you an abstraction over what's happening out in the environment, in the, in the real world, and allows you to trigger work. And streams give you an abstraction over time and allow you to basically see how this set of APIs and events are evolving over time, look for patterns, and, look, and analyze this. So this is a very important abstraction in our world. But there's also something you have to watch out for, and that's a leaky abstraction. Who's heard of leaky abstractions? So leaky abstractions are when you expose details of the underlying implementation that really should be hidden away. Uh, and the phrase comes from this guy called Joel Spolsky, a famous software engineer. And, and I have a corollary to that fundamental theorem of software engineering, which is that almost every problem in software engineering comes from leaky abstractions. So who's heard of Spectre and Meltdown? Right? This is probably the biggest software engineering failure of 20 years, which is that almost every chip in every single computer worldwide has a massive security flaw in it. And it's because of a leaky abstraction. But it turns out that the caching behavior of those chips could be seen and manipulated from above in order to access data that should be hidden. That is the definition of a leaky abstraction. And I believe that, unfortunately, this architecture that we're seeing pushing out is a leaky abstraction. I have customers and friends in the IT industry who are already have hundreds, if not thousands, of microservices. Uh, I was talking to a guy who said that they'd rewritten their Kix banking core banking application in microservices, and they've replaced 1,500 CICS mainframe transactions with 1,000 microservices. Doesn't seem to me necessarily to be an improvement. It will scale better. It's more functionally recomposable. But if I'm the IT director or the CIO or the CTO and there's 1,000 microservices, I'm like, what on earth is going on there? How do I manage that? How do I, how do I control that? I know a guy who has a, who's part of a 10-person development team. He's the lead developer. They already have 200 microservices, and he, as the lead developer, doesn't know what they all are. I teach a course on microservices and, and software uh, service-oriented architecture at Oxford University, and one of my students said that they have this architecture, and over Christmas, he had to learn Rust, a brand new language, because they'd written two of their services in Rust, and they had two developers who know Rust, and they were both away at the same time, and there was a problem, and, and suddenly they, they were like, the service isn't working. Oh, it's in Rust. Oh, I better learn Rust. So that wasn't exactly how he wanted to spend his Christmas. He was a little miffed at this. So 
I think we need some better level of abstraction around this architecture because this is an emerging governance problem. We've swung from too much governance in our beautiful layered architecture to suddenly saying, you're the digital team. You can do what you like. Just go and create microservices in Cloud Foundry. Uh, now, the problem, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, didn't I? What are the things that interrupt team and developer flow? Well, governance is one of them. So if you want to find out about governance, talk to our developers or talk to your developers. Is governance a happy word for developers? No. All of these things are important, but they aren't popular with developers. So there's a really important aspect here, which is that governance needs to be automated. Automated governance actually enables flow. If the governance happens, as part of your CI CD flow, if it happens quickly and fast and in an automated way, then it actually makes your developers more productive because they find out the problems earlier, they shift everything to the left, and they're happier. So this is really important. And we have a very simple vision of what automated governance is in our world. We, we realize that actually a lot of what we provide to you is governance. That's a lot of the value that we provide as WSO2 through our ESB, through our API management, through our identity access management capabilities. In many ways, these are governance products, but they're automated governance. So what is governance in our world? We have a policy store that could be security policies, it could be throttling policies, it could be uh, ESB flows. You can think of those all as trying to capture the desired state of the world, how we want the world to be. In your CI CD system, your tests are effectively saying, this is the policy I want applied to the world, this is the desired state I want, is my unit and system tests. Then you have something that enforces that state of the world. And in our world, that's usually a gateway. It's our identity and access management gateway or our API gateway. And that tries to enforce that policy, enforce the view of the world. But it also observes. It also acts as an observation control point, And it sends data to the observ observability layer. And the observability layer pulls together the way you want the world to be and the way the world actually is and lets you see where are we. That could be your Jenkins report. That could be your API manager analytics. It could be your ESB analytics or, or in the future, your ballerina anal analytics. So this, I think, is a really important mindset to have. Because I think without governance and without automated governance, all of our abstractions are going to be leaky. So let's come back to biology. This, can anyone guess what this is? Cells. cells, yes, these are cells. And the most obvious thing here are these boundaries. In the cell world, they're called membranes. And the cell is the basic structural functional and biological unit of all known organisms. It's really the building block. And it's why we as humans or plants or whatever are not just like a big puddle of atoms, a big puddle of goo lying on the floor, not doing much. Because the cells are the boundaries that allow each unit to do what it's meant to do. And that's why I think this is a really important mindset, because that thousand microservices sitting in, a, in Kubernetes are beginning to look like a puddle of atoms, and not like a set of things that I, as a CTO or CIO, can look at and say, OK, I can compose this in a useful way to do something valuable for my organization. And the really important thing of how these work is that the boundary layer has these things called receptors on it. So receptors react to signals from outside the cell, 
And then there's something called transmembrane signaling that passes those signals through to the inside of the cell and allows the cell to act on it. And there are hormones and enzymes and a whole set of signals that come into each cell. This is basically a micro-gateway. This is what a micro-gateway is. It's a, it's a system that basically protects a set of resources inside your, your system and, and passes on only certain signals. So we need some kind of non-leaky units of abstraction. We need composability. And, and I see a cell, and, a, and a, you'll find out more if you go to Asanka's talk tomorrow, but it's basically saying, well, we've decoupled in those dimensions, the functional, the infrastructure, and the organizational. Now we're recoupling around teams to create new capabilities with DevOps and cloud and a control plane and a data plane. And then in that cell, you can be as agile as you like. But outside the cell, there's a set of governance rules. There's a set of policy there's a control point that gives you some control and governance over that without inhibiting the agility. So it's a balancing act between governance and agility. And I think this is really important because I think we're swinging from one extreme to the other and we don't want to do that. We want to stop halfway and, and keep some governance as we move towards more agile methods. So this has been a nice bit of theory, and I did warn you. Uh, but, you know, what are we doing about this? Are we, is, you know, is this just all talk, Paul, or are we actually doing something about it? And what we're doing about this is a whole bunch of things. But the most obvious things that we're doing, uh, that we're announcing today and tomorrow, uh, are our reference architecture and reference methodology that are helping you understand this cellular approach and how to move forward. Uh, we're, Ballerina is a key part of this story, and we're also starting to ship a set of micro components that we feel fit better into this agile enterprise and give, some, give a, a, a stepping stone towards agility for people who are using config over code based approaches. So our cellular architecture uh, is really a, a trying to say, how can you apply this? And we've been very deliberate that at the moment, this is something that is not directly tied to our technology. Over the next year, we will be saying, how does this fit into our existing products? How does it fit into Ballerina? How can you use our products to build this architecture? But Asanka and I sat down and we said, we deliberately want to produce something that is a little more abstract. In the past, we at WSO2 have always started straight down in the bits and bytes in the technology. And, and that's great, but sometimes we miss the bigger picture. And we deliberately wanted to start with the bigger picture here. The next thing is this reference methodology. And I, and I really do encourage you to go to a Sanka session. And, and I want to make a really key point here, that this is not a race. This is about a journey. We're all being drawn to be more agile. Our boards of directors, our customers, our partners, our employees, all want agility and adaptability. But you can't hurry this. You can't just say, I'm going to junk everything I've done and move straight into a completely cloud-native architecture. I'm going to throw away all my legacy. That is not what this is about. This is about moving to the right in this picture. And you may not move all dimensions to the right at the same time. And you may not want to move all of those to the right. So I gave this talk at an enterprise architecture conference in, in London two weeks ago. And somebody said to me, Paul, well, we're just, we're just really getting our heads on this, and we, we can't be there. Uh, and, and I said, OK, well, tell me a bit more. And they said, well, you know, we work for the Ministry of Defense, which is the equivalent of the Department of Defense. 
And, and of course, we have a lot of rules and governance things. And I'm like, well, that's fine. You know, you, if, you, if you jump straight to a cell-based, self-organized architecture and continuous agility, that is not going to make your customer happy. You know, that is not going to meet the requirements of controlling a missile in flight, right, today. So this is a journey, and I think that's a really important message. The other thing that we've really done over the last uh, few months is to look at our products and say, how do these fit into a cloud-native world? And I want to stress this is actually much, much more deep than it looks. So a lot of people are taking their ESBs and brokers and gateways and saying, we can package this up in a container. You can deploy it in Kubernetes. And we at WSO2 did that three years ago. That's not what this is about. What this is about is when you have a distributed observability through Jaeger, Open Tracing, Prometheus, ELK, when you have a cloud orchestration system like Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes, a lot of the things we built into an ESB or a broker or a gateway are actually taken care of by that infrastructure. And you can radically simplify what it means to be an ESB or a gateway when you deploy into that infrastructure. And that's really what we're doing with these micro components. So I, I, I suggest if you're interested in that, you go to some of the EI and gateway sessions to find out what that really means. And finally, Ballerina is a, is a radically different way of looking about, at this, which is to say, if coders like to develop code, then maybe there's a way of speeding up integration through code. And, and move away from config over code to code over config. And that's a radically different approach. And it's, I think this is, as Tyler said, a long-term strategy. And, and we are both using this in ways. So our next version of our gateway uses Ballerina under the covers. You don't have to know about that. But there are also, as Tyler said, people coding in Ballerina and using it to add some agility to their integration. So if you're really interested in this, come along on Wednesday to our first ballerina con. And I'm giving a keynote. Uh, I'm giving a live demo. If you want to see a CTO make a fool of themselves by failing with a live demo, this could be one of your best chances all week. So that should be fun. I just want to finish. I've got 30 seconds left. It's flashing red at me with this quote. So every science is based on abstraction, and science are differentiated by their abstractions. This, I think, captures what I've been trying to talk about. Enterprise architecture is complex. And unless we get the right abstractions, we are going to end up in a mess. And I hope that I've persuaded you that biology is a good place to look for when you're looking for abstractions in complex systems, but also that there, is, there are good abstractions to be had if you have the right governance, if you have the right vision, and, and that this is where the cellular model can help provide the right abstractions for enterprise architecture and help you move to the right in your journey. So, uh, you know, I, think, I, think, I hope that's been a useful talk. Uh, I, I, the summary is up behind me, but I don't really need to say it. I think you've all been paying attention. I've seen some, some, some uh, not too many people zoning out. So I just want to thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.